In the previous lecture, we proved um, the cyclic case of Kummer theory. We stated Kummer theory in the, um, for the finite abelian case. And um, we defined what is dual of an abelian group. And we showed that every non-trivial element of, the, of an abelian group um, does not belong to kernel of some element in the dual. Let me go through these statements a bit slower. Let's recall the statement of Kummer theory uh, in the case of uh, abelian extensions. So in the abelian case, similar to the cyclic case, we have the assumption that F is of characteristic zero and it has enough um, roots of unity. So it has an element of order N inside F. We fix an algebraic closure F bar of the field F. And this time we consider all the intermediate uh, subfields of F bar and that are um, finite Galois extensions and the Galois group is abelian of exponent N. On the internal side, we look at all the finite subgroups of F cross over F cross to the N. Then we define lambda and delta um, by adding the nth roots of the cosets that represent uh, the coset representatives of the elements inside A bar, the subgroup that's given to us. By adding them to the base field F, we got an intermediate subfield. That's my, my lambda. And delta of an intermediate subfield, similar to the cyclic case, consists of the cosets that are represented by power and powers of elements of the intermediate field that belong to the base field F. We want to show that lambda and delta are inverse of each other. And furthermore, the gamma group of the extension U over F is isomorphic to the dual of delta V. I also pointed out that dual of a finite abelian group is always isomorphic to the abelian group itself, but the isomorphism is not quite canonical. And one can prove this using classification of finite abelian groups. What we will do show before showing the classification of finite abelian groups later in this course, what we will do show in today's lecture is that um, dual of an abelian group have the same cardinality as the abelian group itself and the dual of the dual of an abelian group is canonically isomorphic to the finite abelian group that we started with. So these are the statements that we will prove in today's lecture. But let me recall again what, the, what is dual of an abelian group. Uh, if I start with a finite abelian group A, the dual of A is the group of, is the set of all the group homomorphisms from A to a unit circle S1. And we pointed out that even though I'm working with unit circle in S1, if A is of exponent N, then the image consists of nth roots of unity. So I can change it to nth roots of unity in F bar. So there is no uh, difference between looking at nth roots of unity in F bar and looking at nth roots of unity in complex numbers uh, from um, group theoretic point of view, meaning up to an isomorphism. So that's, uh, that is one of the remarks that we made in the previous lecture. The, the other thing that uh, we pointed out was that by pointwise multiplication, and the, group, um, the group of all the group homomorphisms from A to S1, and the set of all the group homomorphisms from A to S1 form a group. Um, and I also point out, uh, pointed out that um, elements of the dual group, uh, we often refer to them, we often refer to a group homomorphism from A to S1 by characters. So um, an element of a, a hat is called a character of A. <clears throat> we pointed again, we, we showed this important lemma that um, this important lemma that 
every non-trivial element of A does not belong to kernel of some character of A. So intersection of kernels of characters of A is trivial. This is what we proved by looking at um, all the, by starting with the cyclic group A, creating a character of the cyclic group A, uh, where the, um, A is sent to something that's not one, <clears throat> and then extending this character to a character of A. Now, <clears throat> the next result that we want to show is the following lemma that uh, if A is a finite abelian group, then the group of characters of A cannot have more, more, than, more elements than A itself. So cardinality of A hat is at most cardinality of A. We are going to prove this lemma by induction, by a strong induction on the cardinality of A. <clears throat> um, since A is a finite group, uh, it has a maximal subgroup. So among all the possible subgroups, I take one of them is the largest, meaning every, every other subgroup of A that contains M is going to be either A or M. So there is nothing between A and M. So suppose that M is a maximal subgroup of A. Again, there is such a thing because A is a finite group. Because there is a bijection between subgroups of the quotient A over M and those subgroups of A that contain M, so those subgroups of A that contain M, I can mod them out by M and get a subgroup of A over M, and I can look at the pullback of a subgroup of A over M and get a subgroup of A that contains M because of this bijection. And because M is maximal, inside A, we deduce that A over M has no non-trivial proper subgroup. So it has only two subgroups, either trivial subgroup or the entire A over M. So this implies that A over M is a cyclic group of prime order. So we have seen a similar argument earlier uh, for this kind of setting that if I give you a group with no non-trivial proper subgroup, then it's a cyclic group of prime order. So it's a cyclic group of a prime order. That means what? That means that uh, it's generated by one element, one coset, and it has prime order. Suppose A to the P is some element inside and it should belong to the maximal ideal. Yeah. Now, I want to understand how many elements dual of A has. I want to give an upper bound for the possibilities of elements of A hat. So I start with chi in A hat. I restrict it to M and I see what, it, what the value of chi is at A. Because A over M is generated by the coset that's represented by A, the element small a, as soon as I understand what chi restricted to M is and what chi of A is, by knowing these two information, restriction of chi to the maximal subgroup capital M and value of chi at A, these two information are enough to understand chi. So chi is uniquely determined by these two information. Now, when I restrict chi to m, I get a character of m. So chi restricted to m is an element of m hat. So this means the number of possibilities for this restriction is at most the number of elements of the dual of m. And by strong induction hypothesis, M hat has at most M elements. So the cardinality of M is an upper bound for the possibilities of chi restricted to M. Now, let's fix one of these possibilities. So let's fix one of the 
characters of M hats and assume that chi restricted to M is supposed to be this particular character of M. Now, how many possibilities do I have for chi of A? Notice, whatever chi of A is, when I raise it to power P, it's supposed to be chi of B. B belongs to M. So knowing chi restricted to M, we do know what chi of B is supposed to be. So chi of B, we know what it is. That means we know what chi of A raised to power P is. That means chi of A has at most P possibilities because a polynomial of the form X to the P minus chi of B equal to zero has at most P solutions. So this means as soon as I fix chi restricted to M, I get at most P possibilities for chi of A. I have cardinality of M possibilities for this restriction. I have chi of, I have P possibilities. After fixing this, I have P possibilities for chi of A. Altogether, we get an upper bound for the number of possibilities of elements of A hat. And the upper bound is the cardinality of M times P. But that's exactly cardinality of A because cardinality of, because M is of index P because A over M is a cyclic group of prime order. So again, for each chi restricted to M, there are at most P possibilities for chi of A. So all together, we get this upper bound for the number of possibilities of chi itself. And this is equal to the, to the number of elements of A. This completes the proof of this lemma. So the uh, cardinality of A hat is at most cardinality of A. Now we can put these two lemmas together and prove the following important theorem about finite, uh, duals uh, of finite abelian groups. So suppose A is a finite abelian group. Then dual of A has the same cardinality, has the same order as uh, A itself. Second, A is isomorphic to dual of the dual of A. So dual of A is an abelian group, is a finite abelian group. So I can talk about dual of the dual. Now, I, we can even give the isomorphism. The isomorphism is a very nice map. Starting with an element A, I need to give you an element of the dual of dual of A. That means what? I need to feed this L of A an element of dual of A, which means a chi, a character of A. And then it's supposed to give me some element of S1. So I give it a character, and what does it? How can I get an element inside S one? I just evaluate this character at A. So L of A evaluated at chi is just chi of A. So that's the isomorphism that we, that is the isomorphism. Uh, we we claim that this is an isomorphism. Okay, we start by studying this L a bit better. We need to understand it before we get to the proof. We show that it is indeed a group homomorphism. Then we show it's injective. Then we use the previous lemma and argue that A hat hat cannot have more than uh, more elements than A itself. So knowing that L is injective implies that it is also surjective. Along the way, we also get the first one. OK, so let's go into the proof. Let's start with L. I'm fixing A, and then I want to understand what is L of A. What is L of A? L of A, I'm going to think about it as L sub A. So this time A is fixed. I'm fixing a small a, and then I want to understand what is L of A. And I'm going to denote it by L sub A in order to make sure that A is fixed. I feed it a character of the group A, and it's supposed to give me an element inside the unit circle. L sub A of this character 
is nothing but value of the character at A. You can think about it like evaluation now. I'm evaluating chi at A. Now, why is this a group homomorphism? So when I feed it product of two characters, this I have to evaluate the product of these two characters at A. By definition, it's point-wise multiplication. I have to evaluate the first one at A and, this, and then multiply it by the value of the second one at A. That's evaluating the first one at A and multiplying by the evaluation of the second one at A. So as we can see, L sub A is indeed a group homomorphism from A hat to S1, which means it belongs to A hat hat. So it belongs to the dual of the dual of A. Now, the way that we are defining L of A is by setting it to be L sub A. So at least as a function now, it is well-defined. Given an element of the group A, we are getting an element of the dual of the dual of A. Next, I need to argue why L itself is a group homomorphism. So I feed it product of two elements, A1 times A2, and I need to argue that L of A1 times A2 is L of A1 times L of A2. L sub A1, A, A2 of chi means I have to evaluate chi at A1 times A2. Chi is a character, chi is a group homomorphism. So I am getting chi of A1 times chi of A2, which means I'm evaluating chi at A1 and then multiplying it by evaluation of chi at A2. And that's how we define product of two elements inside. You see L sub A1 and L sub A2, both of them are characters of the dual group. I'm evaluating these characters of chi. It's like multiplying the characters and then evaluating it at chi. So we see that this function is the same as the product of these functions. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. This shows that L is a group homomorphism. Now we want to show that L is injective. So, so far we showed that L is a group homomorphism. Now, why is L injective? Knowing that L is a group homomorphism, to show that it's injective, it's enough to show that no non-trivial element can be inside its kernel. I pick a non-trivial element. I want to show that it cannot be inside kernel of L. But what do we show about dual of finite abelian groups and non-trivial elements? We said that because A is a finite abelian group, every non-trivial element is sent to not one, by at least some character of A. So because A is not trivial, there exists an element of the dual group which doesn't say send A to one. There exists chi in A hat so that chi evaluated at A is not one. Chi evaluated at A, that's L of A at chi. This is not one. This means L sub A or L of A cannot be identity, cannot be a trivial, not identity, cannot be the trivial element of the dual group because the trivial element sends everything to one. Now L of A doesn't send chi to one. So L of A cannot be one, the constant function one. So A, that means that A is not inside the kernel of L as we wanted to show. So this means this is not the constant function one. That means uh, the kernel of L is trivial. N no non-trivial element of the group A can be inside the kernel. So altogether, we deduce that L is injective. In particular, the cardinality of the domain of A, L, cannot be more than the cardinality of the codomain of L, which means Cardinality of A cannot be more than cardinality of the dual of the dual of A. 
But what did we prove in the previous lemma? In the previous lemma, we showed cardinality of dual of infinite abelian group is always at most cardinality of the group itself. So we showed this in the previous lemma. If I apply the same statement for a hat, I get that cardinality of the dual of the dual is at most cardinality of the dual. So cardinality of a hat hat cannot be more than cardinality of a hat. That one cannot be more than cardinality of a. Now we have two opposite kind of inequalities. Using both of them, we deduce all of them should be equal. So cardinality of A is the same as cardinality of its dual, and that one is the same as cardinality of the dual of the dual. That shows part one. And at the same time, it tells us that I have an injective map between two finite groups that have the same cardinality, and therefore my injective map is a bijection. So L, which is an injective group homomorphism from A to A hat hat, is an isomorphism. And that's exactly what we wanted to show. This is an injective group homomorphism. And they have the same cardinality from which we deduce that L is an isomorphism. This completes proof of this theory. OK, now that we know enough about uh, dual of finite abelian groups, we know that uh, dual of a finite abelian group has the same cardinality as the group itself dual of the dual is isomorphic to the group itself. Now that we know these statements, let's go to the proof of a finite abelian case of coma theory. We have already defined a lambda and delta. We have, um, we have to show that they are well-defined. So we, we have the setting, we, we know what they are, but let's see why they are well-defined. Let's start with lambda. So suppose my, I'm given a finite abelian group, A bar, whose elements are given by the coset representatives A1, A2, da, 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 AM, in the quotient of F hat by F hat raised to power N. So that's A bar. Let's pick zeros of X to the N minus A sub I. So we know that each time we have n choices, but let's pick one of them and let's denote it by the nth root of a sub i in the algebraic closure of f that we have chosen f bar. As we have discussed many times, if nth root of a sub i is one of the zeros of x to the n minus a sub i, the other zeros of the x to the n minus a sub i are of the form zeta raised to power j times nth root of a sub i. So these are distinct. Um, these are zeros of x to the n minus a sub i. Then one can use the generalized factor theorem, compare the degrees, compare the leading coefficients, and get the equality. So altogether, we get that x to the n minus a sub i for every i is the same as the product j goes from 0 to n minus 1 of x minus zeta to power j times the nth root of a sub i. Now I look at product of all of these things. As i ranges through 1 to m, where m is the cardinality of a hat. So I'm getting a binomial in f bracket x. And zeros of this binomial, we understand, zeros of this binomial are of this form. Now. I want to study a splitting field of this binomial. This means I need to add this to my base field, which is f. This portion is already inside f. So this means these are the only ones that we need to add to the base field in order to get a splitting field of g over the base field, capital F. So altogether, we get that this is a splitting field of this binomial g over the base field, capital F. Knowing that zeta belongs to the base field, we get that this, after adding the nth roots of a sub i's to the base field f, we end up getting a splitting field of g over f. In particular, 
This is a normal extension. This is a finite normal extension. Now, in addition, we know, we assumed that characteristic of F is zero. Therefore, every, every algebraic extension is separable. So altogether, we get that this is a finite Galois extension. So this is a finite Galois extension, not bad. So next thing I need to argue is why um, the group of automorphisms, why the Galois group of this is abelian. How can I show that? Similar to the cyclic case where we considered, where we used Kummer pairing, we do the same here. In the cyclic case, we looked at the single nth root of a sub a in order to get that the image is going to be cyclic. This time, it's uh, the group that we are working with is not cyclic. And we need to work with all the elements of the group that we have. So we consider all the cosets that are represented by a sub i's. Let's call them a sub i bar. Use the Kummer pairing where we fix the second component to be one of these a sub i's. For each one, I get an element of the dual of the, okay, now let's call it not, let's don't call it dual because at this point, I don't know if it's a billion or not, but we do get a group homomorphism from the automorphisms from the Galois group of E over F to nth roots of E units. So we get a group homomorphism. Now let's put all of these group homomorphisms together and let's denote the map that we get by F sub A, a bar, capital A bar, where A bar is the group that's given by these guys inside F cross over F cross to the N. So I put them all together and get a map from the Galva group of E over F to the product of M sub Ns. How many times? M times where M is the cardinality of A bar. So for each element of A bar, I get, I fix that and I get a group homomorphism and I put them in different components. All together, we get this M tuple and I call this guy to be F sub capital A bar. Because each component is a group homomorphism, F sub A capital, capital A bar is a group homomorphism. Next, I'm going to show that this is injective. And therefore, the Galva group can be embedded into this finite abelian group. And therefore, the Galva group is a finite abelian group. Okay, so as always, whenever we want to show a group homomorphism is injective, we look at its kernel. So suppose sigma belongs to the kernel of f, uh, of f sub a hat. f sub a hat of sigma is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. What does that mean? How does this, how can we compute this? Let's recall what it is. This is sigma of nth root of a1 divided by nth root of a1. This is sigma applied to nth root of a sub n applied, divided by nth root of a sub n. So knowing that f sub a hat, f sub a bar is, f sub a bar of sigma is one, 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 we deduce that sigma fixes all the nth roots of a sub i's. But remember this E is generated by these nth roots of a sub i's and the base field. Sigma is identity over the base field and it fixes all the generators of this field. So sigma is identity. That means that every element of the kernel of this map is identity, which means this is an injective map. In particular, we deduce that the Galva group of E over F can be embedded into this finite abelian group. And so it is an abelian group. Okay, no, not bad so far. Now let's say, um, let's suppose that I choose different coset representatives. 
then what? Then do I end up getting the same fields? So that's the claim. So suppose that I give you two, two different coset representatives. I need to show that the, the fields that we end up getting are the same. But what does this mean? This means that A sub I times A is A sub I prime times some power of some element inside F. We've seen this before. Then if we take the nth roots of both sides, we get that the nth root of A sub I or the nth root of A sub I prime is some power of zeta times something inside F times nth root of A. But zeta itself belongs to the base field from which we can deduce that there is something inside the base field that can distinguish these, that can possibly distinguish these two nth roots of a sub i and a sub i prime. Okay, let's see how this can help us. If I plug in, instead of this one here, if I plug in c sub i and roots of a sub i, c sub i belongs to f. So this means that the, the fields do not change. I'm getting the same fields. So this immediately implies that the fields are the same. Altogether, we deduce that lambda is a well-defined function because the extension that I'm getting is an abelian extension. It's a finite abelian extension. It can be embedded into the uh, product of m sub n's, and therefore it has exponent n as well. Every element of m sub n cross m sub n and cross m sub n is, has a, to power n is one. So we did get uh, find the Galois extension with Galois group uh, with an abelian Galois group of exponent n, and we proved that uh, the Galois extension that we, we are getting is independent of the choice of coset representatives. So it's a lambda is a well-defined function. Next, we want to show delta is a well-defined function. So suppose that uh, my Galois group is consists of the maps sigma one, sigma two, da, 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 sigma k. So these are my Galois groups. And then by Kummer pairing again, I can fix these sigma i's and view the Kummer pairing as a group homomorphism from delta e to m sub n. So I can essentially think about them as, as elements of the dual of delta of e. So these are group homomorphisms. I can put them all together and we get a function from delta of e to Cartesian product of m sub n's. And f sub e, I denote it, f sub e of a bar is going to be f sigma applied to a bar, f sigma two applied to a bar and so on. I put them all together. Notice that each one of the components are group homomorphisms and therefore the whole thing together is a group homomorphism. Again, the claim is that this is an injective group homomorphism. Why is it an injective group homomorphism? As always, when we want to show something is an injective group homomorphism, it's enough to focus on the kernel and see why the kernel is trivial. So F sub E of A bar is one, Let's say a bar is given by alpha to the n, the coset that's represented by alpha to the n for some alpha inside e cross. Saying that f sub sigma i of a bar is one, what is this? This is sigma i of alpha over alpha. That's why I needed to choose this in order to be able to uh, explicit, uh, explicitly write down what this is. It is sigma i of alpha over alpha. This is supposed to be one. This means alpha is supposed to be fixed by sigma i with no restriction on i. This means alpha is supposed to be fixed by every element of the Galba group of e over f. So alpha is in the fixed field of the Galba group of e over f. e over f is Galba. The fixed points of the Galba group is the base field because e over f is a finite Galois extension. 
the fix of the Galba group is the base field, which means alpha belongs to the base field. That means a bar, which is alpha to the n, where is a bar? That's over here. A bar is alpha to the n, and the cosine that's represented by alpha to the n. Alpha is inside the field, so alpha to the n belongs to the f, f hat to the n. This means that it is it is trivial. It is the trivial element of f hat over f hat to the n. So we showed that the kernel of f sub e is trivial, which means f sub e is injective. Therefore, delta of e can be embedded into this finite product of m sub n's which means that delta of E is a finite group. It does belong to the codomain of delta. Therefore, delta is well-defined. You see, the only issue that we needed to address for delta was uh, why is it well-defined? It's not, it's not clear why this is a finite abelian group. I mean, it is clear that it is a subgroup of this. What is not clear is why it is finite. So we addressed the issue of finiteness by using this Kumar pairing and um, many of them together and deducing that F sub E is indeed injective. From there, we deduce that delta of E can be embedded into this finite product of M sub Ns and therefore delta of E is a finite group. Okay, so now we have the delta and lambda, both of them are well-defined. Let's go and see why they are inverse of each other. To show that delta and lambda are inverse of each other, again, we go back to Kummer pairing and we show that Kummer pairing is a perfect pairing. What does perfect pairing mean? I'm not going to define perfect pairing for general abelian groups. You can see what it is by looking at this particular example. When I say that I want to show that Kummer pairing is a perfect pairing, I mean, I want to think about, again, when I fix the second component, I get an element of the dual of the Galba group. Now, let's think about this map. Given a second component, give me an element of the dual group. Given a, oops, given a bar, oops, given a bar, we get an element of the dual group. And let's call this f hat of a bar. So if a, if hat of a bar not, is nothing but f sub a bar. So if hat of a bar, so fixing a bar, we get an element of the dual group. And that we, we, we want to view it this time as a function of a bar. So that's essentially uh, the function that when I feed it sigma, it, it evaluates the Kummer pairing at the pair sigma comma e bar. So this is a function that we denote by f hat from delta of e to the dual of the abelian group, uh, the abelian Galba group e over f. Now, when we say that we want to show Kummer pairing is a perfect pairing, this means that we want to show that f hat is an isomorphism. So let's see why this is the case. So you can say there is a symmetry between the components. Why did we choose the second component and not the first component? That's an excellent question. Later, we will prove that these are equivalent. But it needs an argument. We will prove this later. That if we start by fixing the second component and think of, thinking about f hat, as a function from the second component to the dual of the first component, and showing that this is an isomorphism, we can show, we can deduce that if I start from the first component and send it to the dual of the second component, that would be also an isomorphism. So that's one of the major properties of perfect pairings that we discuss later. But for now, I want to show that this f hat is indeed an isomorphism. And therefore, the Kummer pairing is a perfect pairing. OK, so that's what we want to show, that f hat is an isomorphism. We have already discussed that for every a bar, for every second component, 
f sub a bar is indeed a group on morphism and therefore this is indeed an element of the dual of the abelian double group of e over f. The only thing I need to discuss further is why with respect to a, a bar this is a group on morphism. This means when I give you two different cosets, a1 bar and a2 bar, then um, what can I say about f sub a1 bar a2 bar or alternatively f hat of a1 bar a2 bar, what is it when I apply sigma to this? By the Kummer pairing, this is f of sigma of a1 bar times a2 bar, but f is a pairing, this means with respect to each one of the components separately is a group homomorphism. So it is f of sigma comma a1 bar times f of sigma comma a2 bar. This is f of a1 bar applied to sigma. This is f hat of a2 bar applied to sigma. And that means that uh, f hat of a1 bar times a2 bar is equal to f hat of a1 bar times f hat of a2 bar. f hat is indeed a group homomorphism. I want to show that f hat is an isomorphism. So we prove that it's a group homomorphism. Next, I'm going to show it is injective. As always, proving something is injective is often, okay, not always, but often it's easier than showing that it is subjective. So let's start with injective. Why is f hat injective? So suppose something is in the kernel of this uh, group homomorphism. F hat of A bar is trivial. What does that mean? This means that for every sigma, F hat of A bar of sigma is one. What is F hat of A bar of sigma? That is F of sigma of A bar is one. For every sigma, so you see uh, A bar itself, is of the form alpha to the n, the coset represented by alpha to the n for some alpha inside, for some alpha inside E cross, where alpha to the n belongs to F cross. So that, that's the definition of delta of E. So I'm picking some element inside delta of E and an element of delta v looks like this. So a bar is of this form. And f of sigma of a bar is nothing but sigma of alpha. So this is sigma of alpha over alpha. So when we say that it is one, we deduce that sigma of alpha is alpha. And this is supposed to be true for every sigma inside the Galva group of E over alpha. So alpha is fixed under the Galva group. But because it's a Galva, Galva, Galva extension, the fixed points at the Galva group is the base field. So alpha belongs to the base field. Again, alpha is inside the base field, implies that A bar is trivial. So we showed that F hat is indeed injective. Next, I want to show that a path is surjective. So let's pick something inside the dual of the Galois group. Let's call it chi. I want to show that chi is in the image of a hat. So chi is a group homomorphism from the Galois group to m sub n. Let's n be kernel of chi. By the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, so you see, Kn is going to be a normal subgroup of the Galois group. So, by the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, the fix of n is an intermediate subfield and it is a normal extension over the base field. And moreover, the Galois group of this, the Galois group of this, uh, this is a Galois extension and um, n is precisely the k automorphisms of E and k automor and f automorphisms of k. If I restrict my automorphisms, uh, my Galois group to this k, 
I get a surjective map and the kernel consists of these elements. That's precisely my N, that's precisely the kernel of chi. So I'm getting that the quotient of the Galba group by the kernel of chi, which is isomorphic to the image of chi, is isomorphic to the Galba group of uh, K over F. And that's a subgroup of this cyclic group M sub N. So K over F is a cyclic Galba extension. And it can be embedded, the Galba group can be embedded into uh, a cyclic group of over N. K belongs to these intermediate subfields of F bar uh, with cyclic Galba groups that can be embedded into Z sub N. So we are back to the Kummer extensions. So K over F is a Kummer extension. So K is a, a, a field of the form F joined with nth roots of B for some nth root of B inside it. And B is an element inside F. So K over F is a Kummer extension and K is an intermediate subfield of E. So that's why we, have, we are in this setting. Now let's uh, go back to the cyclic case of Kummer theory. You see this, uh, this surjectivity part is quite subtle, right? So I want to create this chi. So I need to use a lot of results uh, from cyclic extensions from, uh, in order to, to go and create chi. Again, what is the idea? So I am giving you this chi from the Galba group. When I look at the image of chi, it's a cyclic group. Now, this cyclic group would be a quotient of the Galva group. This means it should be viewed as Galva groups of some intermediate subfield. This intermediate subfield we call K. And that would be a cyclic extension of the base field that can be embedded into the cyclic group of order N. Therefore, it's a Kummer extension. Kummer extensions, we understand fairly well. It is of this form. And the reason that we understand it fairly well is because of the Kummer pairing restricted to these guys. F sub B bar gives us an isomorphism between the, the Galba group and, and the image. F sub B bar is an injective map from the Galba group of this Kummer extension to uh, M sub N. Okay, so let's write it down. F sub, uh, so for every sigma inside the full automorphisms, we have this. F hat of B bar is the Kummer pairing of sigma and B bar, but that only depends on, the, on what sigma does to this field. Because at the end of the day, this is what? This is, this is sigma of the nth root of B over nth root of b. So it only depends on what sigma does to nth root of b. So it only depends on this restriction, which is the same as saying that I can focus on the extension f joined with nth root of b in order to understand um, f hat of b bar. So f sub b bar in the cyclic extension case we prove that this is injective. And therefore, image of F hat of B bar, which is equal to image of F sub B bar, is a cyclic subgroup, is a cyclic subgroup of M sub N. Furthermore, this is injective, as I've pointed out. That's exactly the same cardinality of the group of automorphisms uh, of, the, of the Galva group of F joined with nth root of B over F, because in the cyclic case, we proved that this is injective. And this is my K, and that has the same image as the image of chi. So what happened? All, all together, we end up getting that this image, which is a subgroup of M sub N, has the same cardinality as image of chi. But in a cyclic subgroup, cardinality, so we do not have two subgroups, two distinct subgroups with the same cardinality. Knowing that these subgroups have the same cardinality and they are subgroups of M sub N, 
we did use that they are the same. So image of f hat of v bar and image of chi are the same subgroups of m sub n. So they are equal, equal subgroups. Okay, so now, now what? What are we doing? Well, where are we? Again, let's think about it. I'm giving you chi. So we are given chi from automorphisms of the Galois group to M sub N. I want to show that such a thing can be viewed. So we want to show that chi equals to F hat of something. So we want to show that chi of sigma is F hat of sigma of A bar for some A bar. So we want to find A bar with this property. I'm in, in the seek of finding this A bar. Of course, this A bar cannot be in the kernel. I mean, so how, I mean, how do we want to proceed? If we want to find such an A bar, so what are the, what are the goals? So whatever sigma that I feed it, F hat of sigma of A bar is going to be one if A, if A is coming from the fixed points of sigma. So this means that if I want to understand A, I need to understand kernel of sig chi and then choose A from the fix of that guy. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. That's why I looked at kernel of chi and then looked at fixed points of kernel of chi. So let's go back. Now that I motivated the steps a bit further, let's go back to where we were. So we looked at the kernel, we looked at, uh, we used the fact that it's a Kummer extension, we found this B bar, and now we found it in a way that F hat of B bar has the same image as chi itself. Because uh, these are uh, cyclic extensions and we, we know that it's a Galois extension, we can lift this, uh, generator of uh, automorphism to an automorphism of E itself. So we can find sigma naught, an element of the automorphisms of E over F, whose restriction to K gives me a generator of this Galois group. So sigma naught restricted to K generates the Galois group of uh, K over F. Now, F sub B bar, remember F sub B bar is injected and I'm applying it to this Galva group. And this Galva group, which is the same as this one, is generated by a sigma naught restricted to K. So if I want to understand image of F hat B, which is the same as F hat B bar, sorry, if I want to understand image of this one, which is the same as uh, image of F sub B bar, I need to apply F sub B bar to sigma naught restricted to K. And that gives me sigma naught applied to the nth root of B divided by the nth root of B. So I look at the group generated by that, and that gives me the image of F hat B bar. That's the same as image of chi. But image of chi, I mean chi, we are applying chi to the same group. Um, now, we are applying it to the same group, but again, we are pointing out that um, uh, sigma naught times, I mean, sigma naught times n, the kernel of chi, uh, the group generated by sigma naught and kernel of chi is the entire uh, Galois group of E over F. So that means that image of chi is also generated by chi of sigma naught. 
So image of chi is generated by chi epsilon. Image of f hat b bar is generated by sigma naught of nth root of b divided by nth root of b. And these are the same groups. What do we conclude? We conclude that this generator is a power of this one. Sigma chi of sigma naught is sigma naught of nth root of b divided by nth root of b raised to some power. Why did I care about this? Because we want to understand whether or not we can write down chi as f of something. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to understand what is chi. Now, again, let's continue with that. Chi of sigma naught is sigma naught of the nth root of b raised to power i divided by nth root of b raised to power i. That's by definition. F of b bar to power i applied to sigma naught restricted to k. You see this Kumer extension comes again and again. This Kumer pairing is there every, every step of the uh, proof. Now, for every sigma in uh, automorphisms uh, in the Galba group, when I restrict it to k, it's going to, to be some power of sigma naught because the uh, Galba group of k over f is generated by sigma naught. So every sigma that you give me when I restrict it to k, it's going to be some power of sigma naught. That means if I look at sigma and com compose it with the inverse of this one, restricted to k, it's going to be identity. So that means what? Every sigma that you give me, I can write it as some power of sigma naught composed with some element that is identity over k, that's k linear. Now, being k linear means that when I apply chi in this tau belongs to the kernel of chi, it's in the, uh, because there is a bijection, so kernel of chi is precisely the k automorphisms. Again, so let's, let's write down what I'm saying. So remember that k is the fix of kernel of chi. Therefore, by the fundamental theorem of Galois theory, the k automorphisms of E is the same as kernel of chi. So this means that when I apply chi to both sides of this, the tau part disappears because tau belongs to the kernel of chi. So I get that chi of sigma is chi of sigma naught raised to power j for some j. That is chi of sigma naught raised to power j. But chi of sigma naught, we understand, is f of b, b, b bar to power i applied to sigma naught restricted to k raised to power j. This quantity itself is, you see, if I go, go about it one step at a time, I can put this j inside and then restrict it. But when I want to restrict it, I can start with sigma itself because this tau doesn't change when I restrict to, to, to k. So it's the same as sigma restricted to k. And that is by definition, f hat of b bar to power i applied to sigma. All together we deduce that chi is nothing but f hat of b bar to power i. And that shows that f hat is surjective. This part is the hardest part of the proof. I encourage you to go over this part of the argument, try to digest the, the, the argument. At the end of the day, again, let's go quickly over the steps. I started with this chi, a character of the Galva group to m sub n. I want to see if I can write down chi as f hat of some element. Whatever that element is, if sigma belongs to the kernel of chi, that element should be um, in the fix of the sigma. So that means I need to think about kernel of chi and think about the fixed points 
of kernel of chi and get a subfield and see what we can do with it. Fix of chi kernel of chi is an intermediate subfield using the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. We discussed that k over f is a cyclic extension and there uh, is a cyclic extension that can be mapped into a cyclic group of order n therefore it's a kuma extension we got this b out of this we wrote k as f joined with nth root of b from there we could understand chi much better because of this implication that we have over here because of this the k automorphisms of E are the same as kernel of chi. So I can only work with the generator if an extension of a generator of the Galva group of k over f. So these are the gist of the uh, arguments. Um, so in the next lecture, um, so this was a shorter lecture. We are going, I'm going to add uh, another short video uh, to finish the proof of the Kummer theory before we move, um, move on uh, from field theory. This would be the last topic that we discuss in field theory. So in, in the next lecture, um, we use this uh, Kummer pairing uh, being a perfect pairing. And we show that uh, we can flip and choose the first comp uh, fix the first component and think about it as a, uh, as a function from the second component to the dual of the first component. And knowing that we, we start with a perfect pairing, we show that the other one is also an isomorphism. Having these tools together, it's rather easy to finish uh, the proof of um, Kummer theory for abelian extensions, for finite abelian extensions. So let's continue in the next.